Okay, um, good morning, everybody. My name is John Mirant, and um, I'm very honored to welcome our first guest today, Margaret Bowden, who is a research professor of cognitive science at Sussex University. As the founding dean, uh, as the founding dean of School of Cognitive and Computer Sciences, she helped develop the world's first academic AI and cognitive science um, pr academic program. A former student of medicine, philosophy, and social psychology, Bowden had a long and illustrious career in cross-disciplinary cognitive research in humans, animals, and machines. Her passionate curiosity about deep questions such as how our brain works, how our, uh, what are the mechanisms of the mind, and how are they evolved, led her to pursue interdisciplinary paths and create new academic fields along the way. She likes to think about those profound questions in computational terms, not in the sense of writing softwares, but in the sense of defining psychological processes with the help of ideas drawn from artificial intelligence. She has written groundbreaking books and other publications in those fields, including Mind as Machine and The Creative Mind. Her many honors include fellowship and former vice president of the British Academy, membership of Council of the Royal Institute of Philosophy, membership of the Academia Europa, and besides her Cambridge SCD, she has three honorary doctorates from Bristol, Sussex, and Open Universities. In today's talk titled, Can Neuroscience, Explains, Can Neuroscience Explain Creativity? She's going to be talking about some of the key issues in the current art and science dialogue. And that concludes my introduction. So with great pleasure, I'd like to hand it over to Professor Margaret Bode. Thank you very much. And hello, everybody. Um, I'm very glad to be here. It's my first visit to Turkey, and I've already discovered it's a fascinating country. Okay. Well, could neuroscience explain creativity? Well, I suppose the first thing I have to do is to define creativity, so that we know what we're talking about. And what I mean by creativity is the ability to come up with ideas or to make artifacts which are new surprising and valuable. New, surprising, valuable. And each of those three words has more than one meaning, as we'll see. New has two meanings, surprising has three meanings, and valuable has, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of meanings, and I'll explain that. So that's what I mean by creativity. So could neuroscience explain creativity? Well, there's good news and there's bad news. Good news first, are the three pieces of good news. The first is that creativity isn't supernatural. Uh, it doesn't happen in some mystical way which is beyond the reach of science. And actually at this point, it's useful to explain the two different meanings of new. Because when you say somebody has an idea that's new, you might mean it's new to them. That person has never had that idea before. You might also mean that, so far as we know, it's new to the whole of human history. I call those psychological creativity and historical creativity. And obviously, historical creativity uh, is a subclass, a special class, of psychological creativity. And what science in general, and neuroscience in particular, is going to be concerned with is psychological creativity, not historical creativity especially, okay? There are extra issues there, but we're going to be talking about the sort of creativity which everybody has. It's not something which is only possessed by a tiny elite of people. You know, the Goethe's, the Darwin's, the Beethoven's, the Newton's, not just them, but every one of you sitting in this hall has come up with ideas that are new to you and actually, in some cases, they're probably historically new too. You may have, may have made a new joke, a new pun, whatever. Um, but we want to consider how it's possible for an idea that's new to a particular mind to arise in that mind. I think that, that is the puzzle um, that psychologists in general and cognitive neuroscientists in particular are facing. So it isn't supernatural, and it's everyone has it. 
Uh, the second piece of good news is that there's one very common objection to the notion that science could explain creativity, which isn't, isn't important. I mean, people sometimes say, oh, it's ridiculous to think that you could have a scientific explanation of creativity, because if you did, then science would be able to predict all of the new creative ideas. You wouldn't need a new Beethoven, you know, for wonderfully creative music. Just go to the scientists with their theory, and they would predict it. Well, this is nonsense for all sorts of reasons, but the main reason is that science in general isn't about predicting or even explaining particular individual events. It's about explaining how certain classes of event are possible. Okay? Now, sometimes, sometimes it's possible for science to predict something very sp specific. So, for instance, if you send a spaceship up and it comes down from space, the capsule comes down from space into the middle of the Pacific Ocean, there's going to be a couple of ships waiting very nearby. They know exactly where it's going to come down. So there are examples like that. But in general, that is not what science <laughs> is about. Um, and so, um, you know, th there's no worry about the apparent paradox of having a scientific explanation of creativity, a scientific theory of creativity. So we can forget that. Um, and the third piece of good news is that there is one form of creativity which, up to a point, can be explained by neuroscience. In fact, up to a point, it's already um, been explained by neuroscience, and we'll, we'll come to that. Uh, so those are the three pieces of good news I'm afraid there are also three pieces of bad news. And the first piece of bad news is that even that form of creativity, which I haven't named yet, I'll come to that, even that form of creativity can't be fully explained by neuroscience. And I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, the second piece of bad news is that the other two forms of creativity, because I claim there are three different types of creativity, the other two forms of creativity, neuroscience can say virtually nothing useful about. And neuroscience is going to have to change um, in a particular way uh, if it's ever going to be able to do that. So that's a second piece of bad news. And the third piece of bad news concerns that last word, valuable. Now, if you ask, you know, um, it's a can of worms. If you ask, is an idea, is a particular idea valuable? What's valuable about it? Well, there are all sorts of answers. It may be beautiful. It may be interesting. It may be, it may fit into a particular m mathematical um, domain. It may be musically elegant, all sorts of different values. And not only are there many, many different domains in all of which we can be creative, okay? So we have to be able to think about all of those. But also, um, values change hugely. Uh, they're sociocultural, most of them, and they, they arise from the society. And of course, society changes. It changes from country to country. It changes from historical period to historical period within the same country, and indeed within the same country. There are many, many different subgroups, social groups, which have different values. I mean, just think of music, for example. Just think of the way in which um, different generations uh, appreciate different sorts of pop music. Think of fashion, the fashion industry. Values changing all the time. So, um, values are very um, difficult for that reason, but there is an even worse reason here um, from the point of view of, of um, neuroscientific explanation, and that is that although science, sometimes including neuroscience, can sometimes explain why we value a particular thing, it can never justify 
evaluate. Science, just in principle, cannot prove that something is valuable. It can sometimes uh, explain why we think that it is, and perhaps one example of that would be the fact that it appears that in virtually all cultures there is a tendency, um, inborn tendency, to value um, shiny, silvery things. Chrome metal, lurex, silver itself. Um, there is a basic tendency to do that, which is partly why it's very often considered vulgar to wear clothes, for example, of that type, because they're sort of so obvious. So you can have a, a, a culture which suppresses um, the valuation of, of silvery things, but nonetheless, it's there to be suppressed, if you like. And I think that um, there's an evolutionary reason for that, uh, namely that um, if you think in terms of our ancestors trying to find places to live and um, you know, going on their travels to try and find a good place to settle down, um, one of the things that would have been a good marker for them would have been um, drinkable water, which is, um, has a sort of calm, reflective surface so that if they found that sort of um, uh, water, um, it would be good in terms of you know, evolutionary reproductive value for them to, to stay around. So I think that you know, there are a few examples, and that's just one, where science can perhaps explain why we value something, but it still doesn't justify it. Um, so science and value, I think, are philosophically quite different. So if what you want your science, scientific theory to do is to justify claims of creativity, you're going to be always forever disappointed. Whether we're talking about evolutionary psychology or whether we're talking about neuroscience. In fact, it follows from that, even if you want your scientific theory of creativity to identify the creative ideas, to pick out the creative ideas. It can't do that either, because it can't assess the value. So what the only thing that you can ask a scientific theory of creativity to do is to explain how it's possible for a new idea to arise in, in someone's mind. Okay? And the fact that it's valued is, is something else. So those are the ones that you're particularly interested in. Those are the ones that will, you will hope you can get a good explanation of, of how they can arise. But that's all you can ask. So that's all that I'm going to be considering in the rest of this talk. How is it possible for um, a new idea to arise? Okay. Now, I said there are, broadly speaking, three ways in which that can happen. In other words, there are three sorts of creativity. And I call them combinational, exploratory, and transformational creativity. Combinational, exploratory, and transformational. Um, and usually the only one that people ever talk about is combinational creativity. But that's just one of three. Now what do I mean by combinational creativity? In combinational creativity, uh, the novelty arises by people making unfamiliar combinations of familiar ideas. Um, and an obvious example is many sorts of imagery in poetry. Another example would be collage in visual art. Another example would be um, putting the sound of a cuckoo, the bird, a cuckoo, in a musical symphony. Those are all examples of combinational creativity. Um, and this is the one where neuroscience does have something, already has something of interest to say. I mean, way back in the 1980s, um, it was already known that certain sorts of neurotropic drugs um, could uh, apparently um, increase the number um, of associations that could be made um, in a, in a particular neural group of neurons. And of course, we now know, when that was the early 80s, we now know very much more about um, uh, 
A, the connections, and B, the chemicals that are involved in, um, in the brain. And, um, of course, there are many, many models, computational models of associative memory, and associative memory is what underlies combinational creativity. Um, and there's a, 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 a marvellous book by a, a literary critic called John Livingston Lowe's. It was written, I think, 1920s. I mean, it's a very old book. Um, and it's about the poet Coleridge. I don't know whether or not um, you know about his, uh, his poetry here, probably. Um, maybe there are two poems you might know about. One of them is called Kubla Khan, and it's absolutely wonderful. And the other one, very, very different poem indeed, is called uh, the, ancient, the Voyage of the Ancient Mariner. And that also is, is, is a marvellous poem. And to cut a long story short, what Livingston Lowe's did was to look at the imagery in very great detail, look at the images in those poems, and looking at Coleridge's library and Coleridge's notebooks, which he happened to have for the 18 months during which Coleridge wrote those two poems, to try and work out what was the origin, what were the familiar ideas which were being uh, combined in unfamiliar ways and slightly changed also uh, by the poet when he came up with those poems. <laughs> and um, so he was talking about associative memory. And although he didn't use that term, he knew perfectly well that he was talking about the associations made in memory. Um, in other words, the notion that there is some intelligible structure to the sorts of associations that can be made in memory. It's a very, very old one. It's not new at all. But now, thanks partly to computational modeling of associative memory, and partly to neuroscientific work on associative memory, we know a great deal more about it. Uh, we don't understand it fully, don't get me wrong, but we know a great deal more about it. And all of that is fine, but even here, there's a but, um, which is relevance. Um, for instance, you might say, if you wanted to get a computer to be creative, in this sense of creative, nothing could be easier. You just shove a lot of ideas into the computer, you know, give it lots and lots of ideas, and then tell it to pick out two at random, stick them together, and then you've got combination of creativity. Well, you'd certainly have something novel but it's very unclear whether you'd necessarily have something valuable. Because for us to find it valuable, we have to see those two ideas as somehow relevant. And actually, one of the things that the poet has to do um, when he's using a surprising new combination uh, is to show you in the surrounding parts of the poem what the relevance is, why he's put those two ideas together. Um, and it actually is the fact that if you took any two ideas, really picked them out at random, you as a human being, not a computer, you as a human being, um, if you were asked to find some way of, of seeing some sort of relevance between them, um, actually you could do it. And the philosopher um, Jerry Fodor actually took that fact to be um, an objection against the very possibility of a cognitive science of the higher mental processes of thought. He had no problems with saying there could be a cognitive science of um, uh, language, the ba basic language understanding, and of vision, and so on. But the notion that you could have um, a scientific understanding of uh, that sort of associative thought that I've been talking about, he said was absurd because there were no limits, there were no constraints. Well, actually, um, that isn't quite true because we have evolved various mechanisms um, to make us attend to things which are likely to be relevant. A very basic example of that is motion perception, motion detectors in the eyes. I mean, uh, movement is very, very easy to attend to, to see, to notice. Evolution has made sure of that. 
And also, evolution has made us um, develop a stru structures in memory. For example, schemes, schemata for various different concepts and um, nests of concepts and so forth, in terms of which we normally think, and which tend to guide our thinking and guide our thinking about relevance and so forth. Again, if you want some examples, think of what um, Freud says about the examples he gives in the psychopathology of everyday life, or for that matter in some of his dream interpretations. He's showing possible roots of relevance, okay? Um, so relevance is hugely important for judging creativity, but it is um, so subtle that we really don't understand it. I think you know the best treatment of this, which has a sort of computational basis, if you like, information processing ideas coming into it, is a very interesting book by Sperber and Wilson. Um, Sperber is an anthropologist, Wilson is a linguist, um, and it's a very rich book. But it can't give detail, specific detail, about um, how relevance is judged. And um, it's a very long way from doing that. So in other words, neuroscience can say a great, great deal of very interesting and very helpful about the combination of creativity, but there are huge and important questions which it can't answer. Yet, maybe it will, certainly not at the moment. And it's got to sort out relevance before it's gonna be able to do that. So that also applies, that last remark, also applies to the second and third sorts of creativity, exploratory and transformational creativity. Now, exploratory creativity covers the sort of case where somebody, it may be an artist, it may be a scientist, it may be just somebody you meet on the bus, picks up a style of thinking from their culture. They don't invent the style of thinking, it's there already, and they pick it up. It may be a way of thinking about chemistry. It may be a way of making music. It may be a way of painting pictures, whatever, okay? But they, they borrow, they pick up the style from their culture. Occasionally, they pick up a style from another culture. But the point is, even in that case, they don't make it themselves. The style is there, it's accepted, it's valued. And then what they do is they take that style, which you can think of as a, a generative system, if you like, a set of rules for coming up with new ideas, and they come up with further new ideas within that style. So, for instance, another impressionist painting, another fugue, another chemical molecule within a particular uh, area of chemistry, okay? Um, and in exploratory creativity, the sort of surprise that you get uh, is that this new structure, this new fugue, for example, which you've never heard before, um, has never existed before, maybe, um, it's surprising because it's new, but it's also not so surprising because it clearly fits into that style. You're familiar with that style, the grammar, if you like, uh, of this particular area of thinking, and you can recognize that this new structure fits into that. And it's partly why you value it, because as I said, the style I'm talking about is already accepted, already valued, okay? Uh, so if somebody comes up with a new structure that fits into that style, it is going to be valued too, okay? Um, so that's exploratory creativity. And transformational creativity, uh, if you like, grows out of that. Because in transformational creativity, what happens is that one or more of the constraints, the rules that define the style of thinking is changed. Perhaps it's dropped, perhaps it's negated, it's altered in some way, so that now new structures can be generated which were impossible before. It's not just that they're new, 
They were impossible before because they couldn't have been generated by the unchanged style. And because, by definition then, they are to some extent breaking the previously accepted rules, there is not only going to be what I call a sort of impossibilist surprise that you think, oh, that couldn't be, but also there's going to be a challenge. Is it acceptable? Is it valuable? Because by definition it doesn't fit into the old rules and the question is, uh, is it close enough to the old rules for you to see and understand the relationship um, and be able to value it accordingly. I'll just give you two examples, I mean very, very familiar examples. One is the, um, in, in, in 19th century chemistry, the change from thinking of um, an organic molecule as basically a string of carbon atoms with bits hanging off, like that, okay, it's a string of, of carbon atoms. And Friedrich Kekulé, in roughly the middle of the 19th century, said, well, let's think of joining the string up and see whether that enables us to explain, for instance, the structure of the benzene molecule, which previously it couldn't, and actually it could. Anyway, so he actually made an entirely new area of chemistry, a, a whole new family of chemical structures possible simply by doing one thing, a topological change from that to that. Okay, so that's a scientific example and I mean there are many others and um, an example in the arts, again there are many, many uh, examples would be um, the end of the end of end of the 19th century, changing to, from tonal music, where every uh, piece was, had a home key and um, was only, um, well, it wasn't only using notes in that key, but it was privileging the seven notes in that key, moving from atonal music, classical music, as most of it, uh, to eight to sorry, moving from tonal music to atonal music, where there was no notion of a home key. The scales didn't matter. You were using every black and white note on the piano, not just seven within an octave, okay? Um, and of course, a very, very different sort of music. And many people still can't get their heads around it and can't appreciate it. I must say, I'm certainly one of those people, um, but, so when you have um, transformation of creativity, there are always going to be issues of, of judgment and comparison with the other stars to see whether it's acceptable. Okay, so that's what I mean by those three sorts of, um, of creativity. And the problem about exploratory and transformation of creativity is that neuroscientists don't have the beginnings of an idea of how to represent um, the structure of the stars concerned. For example, many such styles um, are hierarchical. And although neuroscientists do, especially now with the emphasis on Bayesian prediction and so forth, although neuroscientists do talk about there being you know, hierarchies in the brain, hierarchical levels in the brain, um, they do not have uh, good ideas. Um, they have almost no plausible ideas, I would say, about how to represent particular hierarchies in the brain. And so how to represent a certain style um, is not understood. And still less do they understand, um, at the neurological level, what's involved when, for example, you, you drop a constraint. I think about Euclidean geometry, six axioms in Euclid's geometry. Well, one thing which was mathematically hugely important for people to do um, was to drop the last axiom and see whether or not you could get a geometry that made any sense if you did that. Um, 
Now, how do you represent that in neuroscientific terms? You, have got to, you would have to understand how each of the six axioms was represented. You'd have to understand how it is possible to pick one of them and drop it, just as how it's possible for the musician to pick the notion of the home key and just drop it. Okay? There are many, many, many examples in art and science of transformation of creativity that involves dropping a constraint so it's a general mechanism of creativity that we use, but it certainly can't be um, explained by uh, neuroscience. In fact, they don't even ask the questions. And really, this is um, an aspect of the general point I'm trying to make in this talk. I'm talking about creativity, but actually, I'm not just talking about creativity. I'm talking about the issue of whether or not neuroscience can explain our higher mental processes, our higher level thinking, uh, in general, okay? And in general, what I would say is, if it's ever going to do that, and I have no doubt one of these days, maybe it will, but if it's ever going to do that, it's got to ask the right questions. And the right questions are going to have to be questions posed at the psychological level, the information processing level, the computational level, if you like, where the psychological structure of what's going on has to be understood, you know, in order for the neuroscientists to ask the questions about, well, you know, how can this be done by the brain, and how can that be done by the brain? And you can't do it actually just by talking, by finding correlations. If any of you are thinking, well, you know, um, brain imaging is hugely important at the moment, a lot, a lot of effort and money going into brain imaging, um, surely that can be used to, uh, to help us understand these things. Well, um, yes and no. I once said to Chris Frith, uh, does anybody here know the name Chris Frith? No? Okay. Chris Frith is um, a very important leader, indeed pioneer, um, of brain imaging. He's actually married to and very often works with uh, Uta Frith. Have you heard the name Uta Frith? Well, Uta Frith is the world authority on autism. And the person who, with her uh, student Simon Baron Cohen, first formulated theory of mind. Okay, so these, so Uta is hugely important in cognitive science, and Chris Frith is um, hugely important for because he's a neuroscientist. Uta is not. Chris is a neuroscientist, and he was one of the first people to do brain imaging, and he is one of the very, very few people to whom the criticism about to, I'm about to make doesn't apply. And I'll explain that in a moment. But uh, I once said to Chris, I said, it seems to me that 90% of what goes on in brain imaging uh, is of no scientific interest whatever. It's natural history. It's finding out facts such as, uh, you know, when a person thinks about a certain sort of uh, issue, this part of the brain lights up. The, these, this part of the brain appears to be active. Um, but A, you don't even know what the activity is. You don't even know whether these are excitatory or inhibitory neurons. Um, and even if you do, even if you knew that, you wouldn't know what computations, what psychological processes they were imp implementing. That's the, the question you need the answer to in order to turn all these um, individual correlations, natural history if you like, into um, a psychoneural theory of what's actually going on and how processes in the brain are making our 
psychological life possible. And an analogy would be, think of Darwin. I mean, when Darwin um, sat down to, wrote the origin, to write The Origin, um, he provided a theory of biology, a theory of evolution, which suddenly made sense of the hundreds and thousands of individual um, reports of natural history that he himself had discovered, and, but of course all his correspondents all around the world you know, that he corresponded with, who gave him lots and lots of individual facts, I mean, about animals and plants, which, you know, in themselves might have been interesting. I mean, if you happen to be interested in kingfishers, we mentioned kingfishers earlier, if you happen to be interested in kingfishers, well, you find something out about how, I don't know, the embryo of kingfishers, and that's interesting. You happen to be interested in tulips, and somebody finds out something about tulips, well, that's interesting. But what have kingfishers and tulips got to do with one another? Apparently, nothing. But, of course, they've got a huge amount to do with one another. And Darwin helped us to see that. So what Darwin did was to turn a very, very rich but unscientific natural history into a hugely powerful scientific theory. Okay? Now, he couldn't have done that, of course, if he hadn't had the natural history. And similarly, if there is ever going to be a satisfactory neuroscientific uh, explanation of how we think and how we are creative, um, th that certainly isn't going to happen unless you've had lots of people doing brain imaging first. But at the moment, I said this to Chris Frith, at the moment we don't have anything like this and people are just going on fishing expeditions. I said 90% of the work I said is of uh, you know, is it no scientific interest? And I'm just sort of saying, well, you know, sorry. Cause he said, no, no, he said, no. He said, 95. In other words, <laughs> what I said was true. And Chris actually, and in fact, I wouldn't have, probably wouldn't have said it to somebody who wasn't Chris because it would have been too rude because it would have applied to them. I knew perfectly well it didn't apply to Chris because as I said a moment ago, this um, criticism doesn't apply to Chris Frith because in all of his work, uh, Chris starts out from a psychological theory which guides the questions that he's asking when he's doing his imaging experiments. Let's just give you just one uh, example. Um, I said that Uta Frith, his wife, um, is the leading world expert on autism and theory of mind. And as I'm sure you know, um, one, well, the main, part of the main theory of autism is that for one reason or another, um, autistic individuals do not have um, the normal theory of mind. They're not able to think of themselves and other people as systems with intentions, goals, beliefs, perceptions, which can um, differ from each other. And therefore, they aren't able to structure their own um, activity or to interpret uh, other people's and predict other people's activity in these terms. And so they have huge, huge social limitations. They cannot interact with people or understand what people are doing in these sorts of ways. Okay, so that's... Um, that's the theory. Now, what Chris Frith said, in effect, was, if that's true, um, then it might, be the, might well be the case that autistic people um, aren't able to, that their brains aren't able to cope with what are called intentional verbs. What I mean by intentional verbs are psychological verbs, like, John loves Mary. John hates Mary. Uh, Mary believes that uh, Arsenal will win. Um, Joe wants cheese for his breakfast. Those are all intentional verbs, psychological verbs. 
as opposed to, for example, Mary weighs 90 kilos, for instance. And um, cognitive neuroscientists had already discovered, by brain imaging, that it seemed to be the case that there is a particular area in the brain um, which seems to uh, be processing intentional verbs, okay? For this, just with using normal subjects, not autistic people. In all of us, we can all process these verbs and it seems to us that, um, and it seems, there is a particular part of the brain which does that. Okay, so, what, so Chris Frith then said, if that is so, then we would expect that if we do um, brain imaging experiments presenting language sentences to autistic people, that when the verbs are intentional verbs, not only will they not understand them, which we already knew they appear not to understand them, but that part of their brain would not respond. And so indeed he found. Right? In other words, he found some neuroscientific evidence supporting the psychological theory of, that the basis of autism is lack in the theory of mind. Okay? That's just one example. Other examples in schizophrenia that he did. Now, that is the sort of question and the sort of approach which cognitive neuroscience is going to have to um, apply if it's going to help us understand creativity. And the notion of relevant, of course, is just as important for all three forms of creativity. So everything I said about relevance earlier still applies. Um, but we have to understand creativity at the psychological level first. We have to understand the different psychological information processing computational structures that are involved in the three sorts of creativity and in various different examples that I've given you. And only then, only then will cognitive neuroscientists be in a position to ask the right questions. Now, whether they'll get the right answers, wait to see. But they have to, to, to uh, ask the right questions first. So in other words, um, the answer to the question could neuroscience explain creativity, I think is, well, yes, in principle, but do not hold your breath because the psychologists have got to do the good work and the computational work first. So, thank you. <laughs> so I'm just, I've been wondering um, uh, whether we should uh, treat creativity as a form of process itself or a cognitive process itself or... I'm sorry, I can't hear you. So I'm just wondering if we, we, uh, we should treat uh, cognitive uh, creativity as a cognitive process itself or uh, as an outcome of certain type of cognitive processes, different cognitive processes. So, um, um, I'm, um, that's, that's the question I've been tackling throughout the talk. Yeah, well, it's, it's, the, it's the output of various um, quite complicated cognitive processes and what's more, um, there are at least these three classes um, of cognitive processes that are involved. So if you, you know, if you sort of wrote down on a piece of paper 50 examples, as quick as you can, of ideas that you would call creative, just for example, um, and, and then look at them, you would probably find that um, they fell into all of these three, sorry, but different ones fell into di 
a different one of these three classes. And moreover, the more you look at an example in detail, um, the more uh, sense you get of what sort of thing is going on. I mean, for example, I gave you a few, few examples of creativity, um, transformation of creativity, involving the dropping of a constraint. Um, there are other examples which involve um, the negation of a constraint, which actually isn't quite the same thing. Um, there are other examples which involve the addition of a new constraint. And you, you, you have to look at you know, a, a lot of different cases in very great detail to try and see this. So those are the sorts of phenomena you know, which a theory of creativity, a psychological theory of creativity would need to be able to A, recognize and B, explain in a systematic way and then hopefully underpinned by the neural explanations. So the, the mechanism we are trying to explain Sorry? is, so the, the mechanism we are trying to explain is not creativity but the processes, different sorts of processes that are involved in uh, different Well, I don't know. You might as well say the eyes have got, aren't vision. Well, they aren't vision. Vision is seeing things. <laughs> vision is being a... And I don't mean... I'm not trying to get into the um, problem of consciousness here. That's not what I mean. But, you know, the sorts of information that we can do and that other animals can do uh, and the, the, the sorts of actions we can, that we can take depending on, upon what we call vision... That's vision. Now, the mechanism of vision involves the retina, involves the striate cortex, etc., etc., and similarly with creativity. And my question would be really neurological. You were saying that there are hierarchies in the brain, and you were saying that there are particular areas in the brain processing intentional verbs. How do we know this? Oh, uh, well, how we know that is that um, they, they do brain scanning on subjects uh, while they uh, read certain sentences to them. And so if they read sentences, all of which have got intentional verbs, they find that actually this part of the brain lights up and that part of the brain doesn't light up. Whereas if they use sentences which don't have intentional verbs in, uh, it's different. So I mean, that's putting it very crudely, but that, that basically is how, is how you do it. So notice that, is, that in itself is just a correlation. It isn't an explanation. Correlations alone don't give you explanations, but correlations themselves need to be explained at some point, and correlations of that type are among the data which not only will need to be explained one day by a proper theory, but which can actually lead you on the way to that proper theory, just as the example of the kingfishers and the tulips for Darwin. I can't hear you. Yeah. Some parts of the brain light up when there are intentional verbs used and the other parts when they, when they don't. I mean, it's, uh, we do have neurological proof that, there are, that it lights up. This is how you explain well, it. Well, I'm putting it internationally. incredibly crudely, of course. And, and I mean, yeah. there are all sorts of, of questions uh, and problems with... Uh, uh, with neuroimaging, uh, yeah. some of which, for example, I, I mentioned, I mean, the excitatory uh -huh. inhibitory and so on. But the point is that you do get, um, you do get uh, different results with the different sorts of verb. Yes, all right, and this concerns the verbs. How about the hierarchies in the brain? Is it the same method? Sorry, how about you, what? The hierarchies, you're talking about. The hierarchies in the brain. Yeah. Oh, well, no, the hierarchy. Well, how that's do we know that? <laughs> We don't I was thinking in particular there of um, the so-called Bayesian brain. I mean, the so-called Bayesian brain, um, where 
it's a very general idea about how many things go on in the brain. And some people say it, it explains everything, but I don't think it does. That's another, another issue. Uh, where the notion is that, um, that perception, uh, lead, co the coding that goes on in perception leads the brain at a higher level to predict what the next prediction, what the next perception is going to be, and um, and just it then just looks for errors in its predictions, in its own predictions. So you've got two levels, if you like, of prediction and error checking, and then you, they say that there are you know several other other levels. I mean, it's similar to the sorts of things that goes on in so-called deep learning, mm -hmm. in deep learning, which is done in multi-level. Um, connectionist networks. Um, so it's that sort of general idea that I was talking about there. So in other words, I was saying, yes, the notion of, of hierarchy in the brain, uh, well, I mean, it was important in the 1950s when Carl Lashley talked about it. Um, but it's, it's hugely important now because there's such a buzz, not to say hype, about the Bayesian brain. But what I was saying was that is not uh, the sort of hierarchy that I'm talking about, which is needed if you want to understand the hierarchical structure of a particular um, artistic or scientific style. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you said earlier that transformational um, creativity was, a, I think, an extension of exploratory creativity. Um, I was wondering whether combinational creativity had a relation uh, in the process of this creativity had had a relation to it too or whether it was a completely different process. Sorry, combinational creativity is different, is perhaps different from what? I was wondering the relation between combinational creativity along with exploratory and transformational creativity. Ah, well yes. These are the distinctions I made were, if you like, analytical distinctions between different sorts of psychological processes process that can be involved in generating novelty. Now, in any particular um, in idea or artifact, for instance, a poem, for instance, a, um, a sculpture, it may well be the case that all three types of um, creativity are involved. So one as for, for example, um, well, I'm trying to think of a brief example. Well, take the poem, um, The Ancient Mariner, that I mentioned from Coleridge. This is, uh, it's a poem, it tells the story um, of, of a sailor on a sailing ship, who they're going, the sailing ship's going around the world and various things happen. Now, there's a lot of combination of creativity in that poem because there are, and this is the sort of thing which the, the literary critic I was talking about was most interested in, where what Coleridge is doing is combining, and sometimes slightly adapting, sometimes not, combining two ideas, which is quite clear from the research that this man did, came from different parts of his library. One idea might have come out of the um, philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, which, believe it or not, Coleridge read. Another might have come out of um, a medieval um, traveler's memoirs, which he also read. So there are lots of examples of combinational creativity in that poem. But there are also um, examples of a very different sort of, uh, of novelty. Um, I said that the poem is about um, a voyage, a ship's voyage around the world. Um, and one of the things which uh, needed to be conveyed to the reader was that the ship at one point, uh, probably at two, but certainly at one point, had crossed the equator. But I mean, you don't say, well, it crossed, we crossed the equator on June the 7th. That's pretty boring for a poem. It's not the way you would put it. 
that how do you actually um, so a how do you convey the uh, the fact that they cross the equator and b how do you avoid saying for days on end for a very long time, we saw nothing, we did there, nothing changed, all full of ocean, you know. I mean, you don't want to say that, but how are you going to avoid it? Well, Coleridge um, solved that problem um, by talking about the sun suddenly appearing, you know, on the different uh, side of the sky that you would expect it to be if you were in the southern hemisphere or the northern hemisphere. A lovely um, modern example of that is, I expect everybody here has seen the Stanley Kubrick's film 2001, A Space Odyssey. Have you seen that? You, you've seen it? Yes? Yes. Sorry, have you seen it? The lady who asked the question. You haven't? Okay, well, look, it starts out, it, it looks as though it's going to be, you know, a history of the universe. Literally of the universe, okay, so, and the formation of the earth and so on and so on, and then you get the eight men and so on, and, and you think, well, you know, this is, this is fantastic, I mean, this is very, very interesting, um, but he's got to get all the way to 2001, he's only at the eight men, right? He's got to get through, I'm sorry, now I'm speaking from an English perspective, he's got to get through uh, Chaucer and Henry VIII and... Uh, you know, the Wars of the Roses and so forth. It's all sort of, it's going to take a very long time. This, I know it's a very long film, but it hasn't got that much time. It's also going to be pretty boring because we know all about those things already. We don't want to hear about that. So how is he going to do that? And it's brilliant what he did, absolutely brilliant. And what he did was the equivalent, the visual equivalent of what Coleridge did in that poem with the you know, North and South Hemispheres and where the sun was and so on. He has the... Uh, eight men, they're, they're sort of fighting, but they're too far away from each other to actually hit each other. So they're not fighting in the sense that they're punching each other, because there's a distance between them. Um, but they're yelling at each other, and you know, making um, threatening uh, motions and so on. And then one of them and of course, these are eight men, so they're not very tidy. You know, and there's all sorts of bones and stuff lying about on the ground. And this eight man picks up a human femur, you know, the thigh bone, you know, the, the big bone in the leg. And think of the shape of a femur, right? You know the shape of a femur. He picks up a femur, he just sort of throws it. Well, the first thing he does, he throws it at another ape man and it hits the ape man, so he realises he can use it as a weapon. So that's great, you see. So he doesn't have to be very close to the man in order to hurt him, in order to touch him. So he's very pleased. So he throws another femur, he throws it up in the air in delight. He throws it into the air and the, the bone spins in the air and you see it spinning and as it spins you see it transforming visually into the spaceship, which is almost exactly the same shape as the femur. And this is absolutely brilliant, because not only does it enable him to avoid all that boring history stuff, okay, but he's making a very important intellectual point. That femur, in the story as he was telling it, was the first example of technology. It was the first example of the eight men apparently realising that they could use a tool. I mean, it happened to be a bone, but it was being used as a tool, in this case as a, as a weapon, right? It was technology, the beginnings of technology. And of course, that's exactly what the film was all about. So, I mean, very, very... Um, uh, tight and, and, and clever creative idea. It's not just combinational creativity. I think that is not only a very rich example of combinational creativity, analogy and so on, um, but also exploring ide our ideas, in this case of what technology is and so forth. Um, so for, for, anything, for anything interesting, 
anything um, really complicated or think of looking at a, a painting that you very much admire, I suspect you know some things about it may may be interesting combination of creativity. Some things about it, I mean, if it's in an already existing style, it's going to be an example of exploratory creativity. And if it's making um, a historical transformation in painting, right, then it's going to be a tra transformation of creativity. So you have to look very carefully in very great detail at each example because the human mind is very rich, very subtle, and it can come up with... Um, you know, lots of things can be happening at the same time. So, um, when I, get, if I gave the impression, and I can see I probably did give the impression, that every, uh, everything you regard as creative is either combinational or exploratory or transformational, that's only true about the individual processes, psychological processes, the mechanisms may be going on. But the thing itself um, may well be a very rich mixture of all of these things. Uh, this, this, rela uh, this relates to the previous question, and it's a question about the relation between uh, com combinational exploratory and transformational representation. I would think that the exploratory had to build upon the combinatorial, or co combinational, I think was the word, in the sense that uh, the sentence I'm uttering at the moment is a slavish combination of elements of the rules of English. But the meaning that's driving it is somewhat exploratory, since I don't actually know what the answer to my question is going to be. If that's the case, and I should let you say whether it's the case, um, the question then arises in the relation between the exploratory and the transformational. And I, I have a feeling that the transformational is merely the end result of a lot of exploration. Oh, it certainly is. You're never going to get transformational creativity without a lot of exploratory creativity first. That's certainly true. Um, and actually, the more, uh, what well, I would say, you know, the more interesting, the more creative um, an artist or scientist is who is doing exploratory creativity, the more likely they are to be using their exploratory creativity not just to come up with another and another and another and another structure, you know, that fits in, into this style. Um, but trying to push the limits, trying to find out, you know, what it can do, what it can't do. Actually, if you go to um, a retrospective exhibition of a painter, um, and an exhibition where the, his paintings are arranged chronologically, on the wall, so the early ones, and then the next one, and the later ones over here. You can see this sort of thing happening. You, and the, I'm assuming, for the sake of argument here, we do not, we're not here talking about a transformational artist. Most artists, including rightly respected and revered artists who are hung in our museums, right, and our galleries, most artists do not do transformational creativity, ever. What they do is exploratory creativity, well, and some combination, exploratory creativity, but they do it very, very well, and they also, in some cases, do it in a very interesting way, which is to say, you can see, when you look at the canvases, spread out chronologically, that they're, um, that, that the person is trying to see whether this aspect of the style, um, what it can do and what it can't do, and what it can do and what it can't do. And when, now, when they find, if they find, that um, there are certain things which they were trying to do that this style does not enable them to do, sometimes they will then go on to change, to transform the style in some way, so that they can. And usually, if somebody does that, they do it once, and they spend the rest of their life exploring that style. Same is true of scientists. 
Occasionally you'll get somebody, Picasso was one example, Turing I would say was another. Picasso was a clear example of somebody who made more than one artistic transformation. That's very unusual. Um, but as for the first half of your question, um, I would say that you're coming up with a new sentence um, is exploratory creativity. You know, you're using the you're using English grammar. English grammar here is a style with English vocabulary, obviously, in the background. Um, now, yes, you're combining English words um, because that's what this style is. It picks out in, uh, English words and it puts them together in certain grammatical ways. Uh, I would say that coming up with those sentences as sentences is exploratory um, and yes of course it involves combining pre-existing items i.e. English vocabulary but I don't think it's um, but you're not doing it in unfamiliar ways the combination it, and I don't think it's, that it's helpful to think of it as combinational creativity. I don't think it fits the notion of combinational creativity where you're combining familiar items in unfamiliar ways. There's nothing unfamiliar. I mean, okay, it's unfamiliar in the sense that very often we come up with sentences that are the only use in the whole history of the universe of that sentence, okay? Not like the cat sat on the mat. Um, but it, 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 I wouldn't say it was an example of a combination of creativity at all. I would say it was a very clear example of exploratory creativity. And actually, when the lady was asking about hierarchy in the brain, um, I mean, the only neuroscientific theory that, that I know about, and I don't know much about that, and probably Mark, you know, a lot, of, a lot more about this than I do, but I would say, insofar as what I know about it, the best example, or the least worst example, of uh, an attempt to give a neuroscientific account of hierarchy is harmony theory, Smolensky's harmony theory, which of course was used for language, for representing hierarchy in, in grammar, hierarchy in syntax. Now, a, I don't know whether that is still taken seriously either by psycholinguists or by neuroscientists. B, I don't know to what extent, and I rather doubt, that it's easily generalizable to other cases. Um, we should move on to the next talk. Uh, so. Mark, do you want to follow up? I can't hear you. Uh, I could follow up. Go ahead. Let, let me add, add one question to what I asked before. Do you regard the status of transformation... Can you speak up, Mark? Yes. Do you regard transformational creativity as indicating that we can escape Foda's prison, which you referred to, which says so, sorry, I can't hear you. Can you use the microphone more? Okay. My question is whether transformational creativity allows us to escape Foda's prison, where he said essentially that we can't think of anything that isn't already defined by the language that we use for thinking, with, that we do our thinking with. Um, uh, well, yes. I think it does, yes. Because, as I said, it's... It's what I call impossibilist creativity. That's the whole point about it. It's coming up with structures which uh, could not have been come up, could not have been generated before. Now, of course, as I hinted in my, well, as I said, but very briefly, in my talk, with transformational creativity, there is always the problem of challenge and evaluation because some rules have been broken. Okay, so the question is. Are we going to accept this new structure? Are we even going to understand? Are we going to be able to understand um, this structure? Now, and we all know there are lots of stories, some of them are very tragic stories, actually, 
um, both in art and in science, of people coming up with transformational ideas which are not understood at the time, which are not appreciated at the time, and maybe, I mean, in the cases I'm thinking about, some years later, it may be three years later, it may be a hundred years later, are recognized to be, indeed, very important. Um, and not just important in, in the sense of there wasn't any evidence then, but now there's evidence. There's something much more interesting that, than that. Important in the sense that now they can be understood. Um, because with the passage of time, and very often with a lot of hard work on the, on the part of many people, not just the creative person themselves, but their friends, their followers, their fans, um, oh, and it may take many years, the, the new style, um, is compared with the old style in such a way that people get to understand you know, what the links are, what's going on, um, and why um, the new style seems so strange and perhaps unintelligible, um, but how it can at least be understood, if not necessarily valued. And the example of changing from tonal to atonal music will be a very good example of that. Um, and similarly, non-Euclidean geometry. Um, I mean, prior to Einstein, who picked a non-Euclidean geometry off the shelf that had been um, produced just as pure mathematics, you know, not, not as the description of anything real. Um, I mean, prior to that, when it was sitting on the shelf, um, people, non-mathematicians in particular, you know, what might well have thought, well, you know, why should I be interested in this? Um, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't appear to fit our everyday experience of, sp of space. And uh, so, you know, why not, why not stick to Euclid, keep that sixth axiom? Um, but at least they understood in that case, because it was mathematics and so clear, so clearly stated, at least they understood what had gone on, namely that particular axiom had been identified and dropped. And Riemann, and in another version, Lobachevsky, uh, tried to see what they could do you know, with the other five um, axioms. So at least as a mathematician, you could understand that. But it wasn't until very much later that um, people realize you could actually use it um, in certain sorts of physics. I think there was a question over here. Okay, um, going back to non-Euclidean geometries, I was wondering uh, if you think in the near future uh, there could be a neuroscientific explanation as to our ability to axiomatize uh, space and spatial objects in a way that we can uh, basically explain our surroundings. Uh, a good example that you, I mean, I'm very interested in the non your opinion of the difference and of the evolution of um, geometry over history, because it seems with the Euclidean geometry, there was a questioning um, as to whether the axioms of Euclidean geometry were um, f rather uh, representation of flat space were something that was uh, built in our, our mind, that came through pure intuition, but uh, the emergence of non-Euclidean geometries and their application to nature seem to show the contrary because it's mainly based uh, on experience. And do you believe that there could be a neuroscientific explanation as to uh, the evolution of our well, understanding? Well, I suppose I think that in principle they could, but that's merely to say that I don't think it's magic. I think we understand almost almost next to nothing, less than nothing. We understand next to nothing 
at the moment, I would say, about these issues. I mean, if you look at, for example, the way in which in um, artificial intelligence um, people have tried to model diagrammatic reasoning, they've had very, very, very limited success, and they've been trying to do it for 50 years. And various, um, every day, literally every day, um, abilities which all of us have, spatial abilities, um, which we use to um, understand how we use diagrams, um, whether it's graphs or whether it's Euclidean geometry or whatever. Um, certainly many of these, you know, cannot, cannot yet be um, represented in, in AI. Um, the man who, who, I mean, if you're really interested in, 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 in this issue, you want to get onto um, the website of a man called Aaron Sloan, S-L-O-M-A-N, and his website is called COGAF, C-O-G-A-F-F, -F. and there's a whole rich, I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff, very, very interesting stuff, all different on, on that, but just if we're talking about the development, evolution, and development in childhood, um, of, math of mathematics, of geometry and other areas of mathematics and AI's problems with it, he has a huge amount to say about that. But I mean, you know, to, to um, put it in a nutshell, he says, well, I just said, I mean, he says, we, haven't got a, we really haven't got much of a clue yet in AI. Um, but these are hugely important questions, you know, for, for understanding the mind. And we don't even understand how it is um, and of course, developmental psychologists have tried too. Of course, they've asked questions about how children's understanding of space develops and so on and so forth. I'm not saying nothing is known, but I'm saying a huge amount is not known. And even if you find, even if you can say something interesting about what the actual behaviour is as the child develops, fi uh, finding the mechanism hypothesizing the psychological me underlying mechanisms that do this is very, very difficult. Um, I mean, another name I would mention here, although she's not specifically concerned with geometry but other things, but very, very interesting uh, and relevant work of Annette Carmiloff-Smith on so-called representational redescription. That's what you want to Google on. Representational redescription where what she's talking about, and she has the most um, amazing range of evidence in, in language, in understanding weights, uh, and in drawing, uh, of how the young child um, increases in their advances in their representational powers, but they don't just advance by trial and error. It's very, very interesting. At a certain point, when they're able to um, do a certain task perfectly well, they've learned how to do it, no problems. So it's not talking about error messages here. They actually generate a new form of representation of their own abilities which enables them, and in fact, they very often they'll get worse at the, at the task concerned for a while, right? But they will then get very much uh, better because they are able to represent their own activity in ways which enable them to vary that in ways which they weren't able to do before. Very, very simple example um, would be um, if you ask a, um, a young child who can draw very simple houses or very simple, you know, stick men, you know, um, draw me a funny man, a man no one's ever seen. Draw me a funny house, a house no one's ever seen. Um, a young child who's perfectly capable of drawing stick men and, and houses will not be able, for instance, um, to add uh, wings or extra arms 
will not, at first, will not even be able to um, start in the middle of their drawing. A bit like somebody learning to um, play a piano piece and they're not very good. They, can, they can't start in the middle. You know? If you ask them to play that again, meaning they've made a mistake, please play it again, they have to go back to the beginning. And, and only later are they able to start in the middle. And so on and so on. Very, very rich stuff. Um, and all of that uh, would need to be need, needs to be understood if you're going to understand um, the development of creativity. I, I think we should really move on to the next talk. Um, our next speaker is. Thank you. Thank you.